picked me up after dark, and we walked back over to Papa's house, which was about three quarters to a mile from this house here, and we walked back over to Papa's house. Papa had a 10-year-old girl named Lucien, and I had to be deaf and dumb. There were more deaf and dumb aviators running around France than you can imagine. And there just weren't boats enough to bring them back to England, I don't believe, hardly. Anyhow, uh, I was deaf and dumb, and uh, I had to be around this little girl and lots of adults who came to work on the farm and be deaf and dumb. It's not easy. It really is not easy. You think that's simple, all you have to do is shut your mouth. Huh? Well, there's things that grab your attention, you know, and especially in my condition, I was, I was really observant of everything that went on. We went back, we talked to the fog. I could watch up along the same river there. I could watch the anti-aircraft it, it fire, and it was pretty. It was pretty. And the British were the ones that came over. They came over quite low altitudes to do their bombing at nighttime. You know, we, we believed in precision bombing, and we did it during the daylight hours. But we talked to Papa, and we tried to talk about this, that, and the other, and suddenly there was a big explosion out in the forest, uh, somewhere about like that. And uh, we didn't know what it was, but it was a good boom. Well, after we had tried to do our talking, and a whole lot was with me, and he did, uh, he translated for the two of us, uh, went back out, I spent a night in the forest, and then they, well, it seemed like the third day anyway. But that next night, I was bedded down out there, and about, they, they eat awfully late, I don't know if I was far. But anyway, it must have been 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. I heard the most terrible ruckus you ever heard. I couldn't figure out what it was. It sounded like the tire wheels of hell uh, going on <coughs> out there. And I'm hidden here, and all this noise is coming from over in this area. Uh, I later was able to find out that they, what they did is they went out with their pans and things like that and they beat them to, to scare the wild pigs and other animals out, out of their crops. Uh, but they gave me a real thrill for a <laughs> uh, <coughs> All right, the third day, they take me into uh, that barn. It's a thatched group barn. Uh, it's in a manger, and there's a pile of hay and uh, straw in the corner, and they give me a blanket. That's to be my home, and so I stayed there for a couple of weeks while they prepared my false identification papers. Uh, I made a poor copy of that this morning, and uh, any of this stuff up here you want, well, you can take. I'd like to keep this particular one of... Uh, Papa, Mama, Verna, and the little girl, Lucien. Uh, they moved back in there, and then they had a, one of these little girls, she was a twin, they had a twin brother uh, from Rwan, staying on the farm to escape the bombing and that sort of thing. And she would come down uh, with, the, with the wine bottles, actually they weren't wine bottles, they were seed or cider bottles, and uh, she'd pick that up, but in there she also had my food. So it wouldn't look conspicuous. Uh, she'd bring my food to me. And surprisingly, I slept real well when I crawled that blanket. Um, I feel like when I go hunting or somewhere else, away from the, uh oh, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time reaching you. Could, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, I sleep real well all the troubles and everything behind me, and I slept real well there. Uh, during the day, they had me do a little work, and they brought various people to come to see me, uh, and these people were, some of them were associated with the underground, some were uh, just friends, and some were relatives, and I, it's kind of like a zoo, you know, they <laughs> come in, and everybody bring a bottle of wine, they bring a bottle of wine or something like that, and they'd give me their best bottle of wine. I think it's still buried uh, underneath that manger in the back there. There's several reasons for not drinking it. I, I wanted to have a clear head for one thing, uh, uh, and the other thing is uh, I wasn't supposed to drink it anyway. Uh, anyway, good people, 
really great people. Let's see where we're going to go from there. I, I, I have good notes here, but I haven't followed them at all. Uh, oh, oh, the very second day that I was there, I should follow the notes. I'm out here. I'm, I'm hidden in here. The second day, some German trucks came out on this little forest road out there, and and they they parked right there, and I'm 35 to 40 yards away from them, and I could tell, I could hear those voices. I said, well, that doesn't sound like French to me, and I didn't dare raise up out of those ferns to look, uh, and you know, I heard a lot of something going on. What had happened is a, a Royal Canadian Air Force aircraft had crashed there. Three of the people apparently had escaped a parachute or something like that. One had been captured. Uh, one was killed in the crash. And maybe he was killed before the aircraft crashed uh, and was just left aboard. I, I later visited this plane. But what they were doing is they were beginning to look for him. Or, or not him, them. And uh, that's what they were doing out there. They could have been looking for me too. They had been to my crash site also. Well, uh, I sat there and I sat there and I wanted to go to the bathroom. I wanted to do everything in the world that you didn't, didn't have any opportunity to do it at that particular time. And while they were gone, I guess one of the truck drivers who was left in the truck kind of walked over towards where I was. And I can hear that front, front or the leaves. Really exciting period. And, uh, they stopped. I probably went to the bathroom then. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, um, and I, the guy left. I could hear him walking away, and I could hear these guys chatting with each other and that sort of thing. Uh, and pretty soon, these German soldiers came back, got on the airplane, and took off and left. Well, I guess you know who was all eyes up around these houses here, the French were really scared that uh, they were going to pick me up then. I was scared too. Anyway, they um, they left. Didn't hear any more from that. Now, they had been to my airplane. When I bailed out of this airplane, I, 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 I looked at this thing and I can't figure it out because I was heading for the forest. I figured if I bailed out and bailed out in the forest, if I get hung up in the trees and things like that, gee, what a wonderful place to hide, you know, away from almost everybody. See, I bailed out, I landed in this thing, and Maurice uh, Duhamer lived over here. He's an underground guy, and my plane crashed in the yard. Now, his mother was standing in the doorway there, and I'll show you a picture of that clock. And that plane came in and crashed right there. Uh, this is really a poor copy, but there's, it buried in about 10 or 12 feet, I guess, and then exploded. That's Maurice. There's remains of the plane, and there's Papa and myself, uh, because I got a chance to go back over with it. Like I say, any of this stuff up here, if it's interesting, you can have it, except I, I kind of like to keep a lot of them on uh, here. Okay. So I almost missed uh, the most important thing of my early stay there. Well, they had me do a little work in this barn. Um, we would, uh, any farmers here? Any farmers here? No farmers? Anyway, they had me, uh, they had some tall rye uh, that had been cut fairly green, uh, but it dried out quite well. And I would tie the heads together, so I would have something about six foot long. Later, when I helped them on the farm, I found out what this was. We took those dogs on page, uh, they would drop a bundle of, of, of wheat off of a table, like we used to use down in Delta there to cut seed. Like they would drop the grain because their, their combine was broken down. But we'd take these things, pick up that bundle of grain and put this, this rye around it and then twist it and then shove it up under it and it made a bundle of grain. Uh, if we only have one farmer here now, you may not know what a bundle of grain is. It's just a bundle of grain. Oh, you oh, got two. Good. And then we would take these things and we would stack them uh, a four or five together with the heads up and then we'd put the chapeau on, which is the hat. We'd turn one upside down on top of it and let it run down the side so the water would run off. Um, okay. Let's see where we can go through that. Change clothes, 
German truck. <laughs> okay, along with me in this little, well, this is a fairly good size part, was a little guy named Mickey, a goat. And he was a, just a young one, a great friend. We used to play together, you know, that little guy would get out there and he'd lower his head and he'd charge. He'd stand up on his hind legs and he'd try to knock me down. And all. We, had, we had a lot of fun out there. Um, now, all my eating is being done in the barn. Finally, they, they said, hey, the evening meal you can eat in the house. So they started taking me into the house. And I ate there a lot of people around that table. When, uh, one night we were having an extra special meal, and uh, uh, I was real concerned about the, about the food. The food was good, man. I was putting on weight. Uh, but the kids didn't eat much, and a couple of them was, were crying. And uh, I said, oh, you know, I haven't seen Mickey for a couple of days. Sure enough, that was Mickey, but we didn't eat very much of it. <laughs> we all felt pretty bad about that. Uh, while I was there on this particular farm, I was outside on the apple trees, and I saw a group of P-47s fly over, and then all of a sudden there was a big explosion. A German aircraft had dived through them and shot down a P-47, and it exploded, and the pilot was killed. But one of those doggone German planes came right back over where I was, and that P-47 was trying to catch up. Now, see, they had the initial velocity advantage because diving from a high altitude, they could go right through you, and then if you got in their sights, they'd, they'd try to shoot you down. And then they'd try to go over an area where they had a lot of German air, uh, anti-aircraft so that they, they could hold you off. Well, the P-47 just couldn't catch it, but I could see those tracers going underneath the tail of that thing, and it looked like they were coming right at me, so I jumped down behind a, uh, a bank, an embankment. I don't know that it would have given me much protection, but I sure thought I was going to get it that day. Um, now, after our, my ID papers were made, we had to go into a little town of Mobile. And we went to a building which was something like a little county registrar or something like this. And a guy in there who spoke good English uh, prepared the papers. And I had to sign the, uh, the papers. It, it wouldn't take a very sharp guy to look on this ID sheet here. That's a, that's a picture of my false identification paper. In this escape kit, we also had these pictures. We already had those taken. And we provided those to them. But uh, down here, I signed my signed my name, and I knew all the difference in the world between the writing, but this guy was an excellent writer, uh, but it didn't look like any of the other French writing that I've ever seen either. Okay, so then I got out of the barn, went back to Papa's, and we started working on the farms, and then things were going along good. A lot of Germans started to move through there. They were trying to reinforce their troops down in the uh, uh, area near where the beachheads were. And then later on, they began to retreat through there. So we had a lot of Germans going through. And any time, let me back up. Before I got out, when I was in this barn, I used to keep a good close watch. And I'd look out. If I saw anything that looked suspicious, I'd jump out. Now, this is a hedgerow here. And I'd run back out and hide that point. When everything was clear, here come home, huh? And he'd be whistling while you work. And, uh, and he'd retrieve me, and back we would go again. Uh, sometimes some German soldiers would come on the farm, and they were starting to take things from the farm. Um, anyway, I'm back working on the farms and doing real good, except that with most of the people that come to the farm to help, they traded help back and forth, like we used to do on farms. You don't do that so much anymore, but we used to do that, and they did. Um, I, I had to be deaf and dumb. There was one family and I never spoke with them. The mother, um, she had about four or five kids. Two of these kids very often ate with us uh, at the Paz house because their dad was a prisoner at that time. Uh, one day, well, I, I, I got to the point where at first there was somebody with me all the time. But I got to the point where I could travel pretty freely around those areas which were away from the road. Um, and uh, I'd go back for one reason or another here or there. Um, 
my chronology starts to get away from me here. Things started happening real fast towards the end. Uh, one day I had come back to the farm and I had gone to the little outhouse. Right there, and I heard the gate open down on the roadway, and um, two German soldiers came on. And they came to the door, and they were all haranguing with uh, Mama. And um, they went into the little milkshake, was right off the back of uh, the building. We had the old uh, separators, you know, the old separators, separates the cream in the milk. And we could also churn butter in there. And they took all the butter, and they took both bicycles. Later on, they came on the farm and took both of Papa's horses. He had big draft horses uh, that uh, were um, much bigger than the German uh, horses. I saw a lot of German horses go by, pulling carriages, weapons, and things like that. And they looked like hobby horses. They were pretty. They were pretty, but they were small, looking more like a saddle horse uh, as compared to the, the French horses. Uh, Oh, we ate, we had fun, we played games, and no matter what happened, then in, in our time, the French could laugh at whatever the Germans had done, like taking the horses or the bicycles or the butter or some clothing or something like that. So we developed a real comradeer. One day while we were working on George's farm, uh, a guy came and Paul came out and said, hey, there's a guy in here from the French underground. I'd heard the motorcycle, he'd come on that. And he was rather nattily dressed. He said that he had something to do with film work, like a director or a producer or something like that. And um, he wanted to talk to me. So first, before he wanted to talk to me, he wanted to ask me some questions. And he asked me what I thought was things. He said, what did you have for breakfast before you came over? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't the day for eggs. We only got eggs for one day of the week. And it's 4th of July, we should have done it. It was a holiday. Uh, but uh, a few things like that. He asked me something about the aircraft, and I uh, satisfied him. And he said, hey, uh, we, we can fly you back out of here, back to England. And I said, oh, boy, that's, that would be great. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, we'll contact you, and we'll let you know. But uh, the Germans began to come down to there so thick that they overran the airfield, so that didn't work out. Um, We walked into a little town of Hutto, and this was kind of stimulating for me. Papa and Maurice, the guy I showed you up there where my aircraft crashed, we walked into the town of Hutto, and we walked past several points where there were two or three German soldiers. And I think they were sent out there to direct traffic, you know, direct their units to go one way or, or another. It didn't bother, uh, they didn't bother us, but I was scared. I really was scared. So we went in town, did our business, got a haircut. I got a haircut, the only haircut I had there in the two months I was there. And we walked back. Well, we started seeing so many German soldiers and different things like that, that I started to get a little uh, careless. And uh, being a young man, I was all of 21 years old. I knew it all. And uh, uh, I knew how to take care of myself, I thought I did. But anyhow, the underground contacted me and said, hey, we can take you into Paris where nobody would ever notice you. He said, you're out to get picked up out here. And I talked to Papa and he says, uh, I don't want you to go. He said, I want you to stay here. This is my way of serving my country and that sort of thing. So I stayed. I was glad uh, that I had. Okay. I told you about the Germans taking things from the, there. They moved me about. They moved me about. If Germans got, if the SS came or somebody else was in the area that they were worried about, they would most often move me over here to a, an old lady's house I called Grand Air. I met him uh, there. And uh, so I spent a lot of time at her house. This is a two story house, uh, much bigger than Papa's house. Papa's house had a bedroom on one end bedroom on the other end, and the center section with the kitchen that had a senior sewing machine and the stove and, and things like that in it. But this one had it upstairs where I could stay. Um, one day while I was there, I looked out of the window and I could see a guy, a soldier, walking on to the premise. And he came in and said he was going to stay there. And he was a, a German doctor. Well, I, I moved somewhere else. 
And one day, uh, while I was over there, we were, I was out with the family from Rouen that had come out to escape the bombing, that sort of thing. And um, the lady was an old lady. She, she was about 40 years old. <laughs> that was fine. <laughs> Uh, Grandmere must have been must have been pretty close to seventy at that time. Uh, but anyway, I was out with this family, uh, and she had three or four kids around, and we were out harnessing up a horse. Uh, and all of a sudden, we looked up. There's five German soldiers on bicycles, and they came on in, and they had their little birth gun. And one of them said bonjour as he came in. Then they went on down to this building here and around about, and pretty soon they came up and just oh, oh boy, how can I forget all of this stuff? So the lady was scared to death. She says, "You go in the house. You go in the house." I said, "If I do, they're surely going to suspect something." She says, "No, you go in the house. All my kids are going to all my kids are going to do all this sort of thing." So I okay. So I went in the house. And sure enough, when they came back up, they stopped, and I could hear them calling the shoe, the shoe, uh, a real loud voice, and uh, see, I'm deaf and dumb. I'm deaf and dumb. Even with the old brown mare, Papa may have told her, and the woman I was working with, and her children, except that I'm sure she knew because she started talking to me out there. Anyway, I said, hey, this is bad news. I saw a rope and I picked up the rope and I said, let's take this out like I came into the house to get something. And I walked out and uh, they called me on over and motioned for me to come over. And I started to push the gate open to go out where they were. <coughs> and the guy, the general soldier, kicked the gate shut in my face. And so I stood there. There's a little story leading up to this. The shoes that the French gave me were killing my feet and I had put my GI uh, three quarter shoes back on and I knew that they were just shining, they were just shining, <laughs> that the Germans, that's all they would look at were those doggone shoes. Uh, but he asked me for my identification papers, which I could understand, I picked up a little French by then, and I made signs I was deaf and dumb, and then he got a little bit angry, and uh, Mama, I my mean, grandma stepped over and said, well, he, he's, he's deaf and dumb, he's a little bit crazy, so the guy, <laughs> Uh, so the guy uh, uh, took his hand and just as though he were writing and I have an old wallet, I almost brought it in and I pulled that out and had my ID papers in it and I gave them to him. And uh, he took those uh, and he looked at them and called over another guy, come here, and uh, they looked this over. And I think the thing they were looking at is on here it says mute down there, which is deaf and dumb. And I was a farm there. Anyway, they, uh, they I said, okay, and they took off. In about 20, 30 minutes, here came a wagon with a horse and uh, 15 German soldiers. And what the guy had been doing, as I perceived, he was there to check to see if this was a safe place for those soldiers to bivouac. Well, uh, they came on and they didn't bother me. Nobody messed with me or anything like that. I kind of stayed away as far as I could, so I had to converse with them. Uh, and they said they'd stay there for a few days, they didn't know how long. So they uh, they started camping, but the word got out that they were going to take me, uh, so I'd take care of their horse and do other manual labor for them. And I, uh, uh, Papa heard this, and he hit about three times between his house and, our, and that house, and, and he took me and we went back over to George's house, or maybe we went back to it. I guess we went back to Papa's house. Uh, well, then about two days later, I woke up at Papa's house, I heard all this noise on the outside, I pulled back the curtain, looked out and there were five German soldiers right by my window. And I looked beyond them and I could see pieces of equipment, some vehicle, some motor ride, some horse drawn, uh, coming over the farm and across the street. This is bad news, there's a lot of German soldiers around, around that house, so Papa came in and got me and said, okay, now we're going to go and eat. You sit at the door away from the, uh, uh, you sit at the table uh, away from the door. So I did. And <coughs> while I was there, a German lieutenant colonel came in twice, very polite, very polite, and uh, said, well, we're going to 
be here several days, I can't tell you just how long. And then he said, I'll need a room. So that meant I was going to go. I would have gone anyway. Uh, and so the boss said, after we finished reading, out we go, we walk through these German soldiers, and there, a lot of them are stripped down to the waist, they're washing up clean. They traveled at night, because they didn't travel at night, they got shot up on the road. So, uh, Papa took me, and we went, uh, I guess we went over to John Mayer's house again, and things had cleared out at that time. Now I'm going to tell you some dumb things. Back over to George's house, he had some boys, and the boy who had come out of the city, and uh, we were there on the farm one day, and uh, uh, a little car came up to the edge of the farm, opened the gate, and just pulled off the little road. Okay, let me do my orientation here. We were standing right here, and here somewhere, this little roadway that went down there, and they pulled off here, and I could see them fold out some paper on top of the hood of the vehicle, and I suppose it was maps that they were talking about. And these guys said, my name's Louie. They said, Louie, why aren't you running? Why aren't you shaking like you always do? Why aren't you running high? You know, they were having a great time. They were really kidding me. So I took some plums off of, off of the tree. Here's a dumb axe, a real dumb axe. It's gonna be followed by a dumber rat. Right? Uh, and I put them in my beret, and I carried them down and gave them those people at the gate and made sure I was definitely down. They tried to thank me for them. One of them was a young officer. And I just took off, you know, the car and saw them going out on the road and left. Now, I know they were flammergasted, flammergasted because French never did fall dirty to the German soldier anything. Um, so I went on back over to one of the places, and then I ended up at Grand Mirrors. And over BBC, we heard uh, dig these uh, dugouts and put logs and dirt on top of them to protect yourself from artillery and stuff like that. So we did that, and we weren't sleeping much. Uh, as, the, as the forces came towards us, they were shelling the artillery that was set up near us, and then, as the artillery moved back, both of them were shooting over the top of us. Uh, it was a little hectic. We weren't sleeping very well. Uh, okay. One day, I was there at the house. I go to my uh, back to Tavares' house, and, and, and Mama said, there's two German soldiers out there in the gray ring. I said, oh yeah? I went out. It's not very really dark inside there. Sure enough, they were lying up on the wheat, dead to the world. This was you know, three fresh wheat they were lying on top of. And that thought occurred to me, you know, I could take that axe and I could split their heads wide open. Or I could take their guns and I could shoot them. 